the new activities, uh, the, the summer baseball and softball going on strong. And for many parents, too, that can be very overwhelming, all the things. Like, we just got used to them going to school, and now we have to ferry them to and from practices and all these different things. And it's like some of you are probably already looking forward to the next school year. Uh, in the meantime, there's also camp, Lake James Christian Camp. It's also a great place to, to drop your kids off for a week. Uh, but as that gets in, in, into full swing, uh, as we had our camp work day just a, a couple days ago, and just to, to prepare this camp for all the, the spiritual work that God is going to be doing this summer, uh, it just felt so fulfilling. Like even something as small as just painting benches and, and, and tables. I was like, kids are going to be sitting on, on, on these nicer benches, but they're going to be hearing the word of God at campfire. Uh, we'll be singing praises to him. So even in the smallest, seemingly mundane things, we can see that God can bring significance to that. So whether, whether it's school, whether it's our jobs, whether it's baseball practice, whatever it is, God can use that to work in our lives and in those around us. So let's go to him in prayer before we begin. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for the, the grace that you've shown us. God, that we can see how you love us in the smallest things if we just open our eyes and see how you are at work. And God, we thank you for the, the opportunities that we have to praise you and to worship you. God, every day, as we see different things we can thank you for, that we can praise you for. And God, we pray that this morning, as we gather here to worship you, whatever fears, whatever doubts, whatever busyness of our lives that we've been carrying with us, God, we lay them at your feet. Because, God, we know that we're not fighting all of these battles alone, but that you are here for us. And, God, we pray that as we worship you, as we dive into your word, as we encourage one another, we grow, and we understand just how much you love us so that we can share that love with those around us. God, we pray all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Would you please stand as we begin in worship? When all I see is a battle, you see my victory.
mighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the
let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and kind of our summer series for, for Sunday school. And, and as a side note of announcements, we got Sunday school classes, 9.30 to 10.30. We've got a Galatian study, a ladies' Bible study, and, and prayer and devotion time. And then in our, we've also got kids' Bible studies. But in our junior high, senior high, we're going through the minor prophets, uh, which I always think, it's, I feel bad for them, all the hard work that they put in just to be called minor prophets. But all the ones that, usually the shorter prophet books in, in the Old Testament, and they all have this very similar theme. Uh, and, and Israel is either in captivity for all of them or about to be in captivity from the Assyrians uh, or the Babylonians. And almost all of them start out with this kind of a scathing prophecy from God about, about all the ways that, that Israel has turned their backs on him. Uh, that they fail to be this nation that God has called them to be. God's chosen people all the times they've failed him or all the times they've turned away from him. But with that being the theme of how most of them all start, almost all of them, by the end of the, even just the first chapter, will have a few verses of hope uh, as they point towards uh, the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection. And, and the, in the book of Isaiah, which is not one of the minor prophets, but one of the major uh, prophets, uh, and it's the same way in that first chapter. He's talking about how Israel has failed to, to, to defend the oppressed, to fail to, to seek justice. But he says this uh, in verse 18, and this is God talking about them. Even in the middle of their failures, in the middle of their, their letdown, he says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They, they, though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And God uses that that metaphor of things being stained but being cleaned again all the time through the Old and the New Testament. And it's like if you ever tried to get red stains out of a light-colored carpet or a white shirt, it's almost impossible. Now we've got all of our cleaning supplies that we, that we have now to try to make the process easier, but how many times do we try to clean our own souls of, of our mistakes, of our sins, uh, and the ways that we fail God, when really the only way that we can truly be clean is to turn to Jesus know that he has paid the price for our sins and that he can clean our souls. He can give us a new hope and a new resurrection. And that's what, it's one of the many reasons why we worship him and sing these praises to him. Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had 
left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. I live shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow God, we thank you that we can always turn to you in our need and in our desperation and in our joy. And God, we pray that as we are about to take communion, that we remember the sacrifice that made that possible. And we reflect on our own lives and, and give up to you the, the ways that we fail and the ways that we are not enough because we know that you are enough. God, we pray all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church family. It's great to see everybody here today. What a beautiful day. And uh, for those of uh, anybody visiting from out of town, we do partake as communion is about one body of believers at the same time, and those will be stationed in the church in the corners there. And if you're not comfortable with that, please come see one of the elders or somebody after church, and we'll make sure that you get communion in a way that you're comfortable with. Uh, I was sitting there when Stephen was singing, and I thought, you know, God's such a powerful God that uh, he just knows how to put the puzzle all together. And, and uh, that last song he sang kind of ties in to my communion meditation this morning. And I'm, I'm going to take a little bit different light on it. So I retired the 1st of the January this year, and uh, uh, I was sitting around the house, and as most retired people can tell you, the days of the week, they all start to run together. And you don't really know what day of the week it is. And uh, so I decided that I was going to find a part-time employment, something uh, that, that I enjoyed doing. So I took a, drive, a job driving uh, public transportation here in Steuben County. And one of the things that they required from me was that they needed a copy of my driving record. And I thought, well, that's no problem. Uh, it's not stellar, but it's, <laughs> it's okay. So I said, I can do that. And I go home and I was struck in with this, struck in, this fear came over me. 
I got to get on the BMV web page. I got to create a username and another password to get this all to work. So I get it all to work, and uh, with Martha's instructions, I knew how to uh, get the printer to work because we have a wireless printer, and that confuses me. So, so I get it all to work, and I push print, and I go back into the room where the printer is, and then paper starts printing out, and I grab the first page, and it says, page one of eight. And I thought, what? How can I have page one of eight? Well, any transaction you've ever had with a BMV is on that page. So they finally got down to the nitty gritty and the dirty part where I had three speeding tickets on there. But I looked at them and I said, this is from 42 years ago. <laughs> Don't these people ever forget and forgive? <laughs> so I take that to the boss and they get it. But what I got to thinking of about was, I'm glad God's not that way. You know, and I walked over to the printer this morning to, after Martha showed me how to get it to work again. And uh, I walked up there and I wanted to print a record of my life out. And today is page 23,936. But the amazing thing about it is God doesn't hold that against me. Because just like we sang this morning, he forgives me, and my sin has become white as crimson, or a crimson stain has become white again. And I saw that in uh, this Bible verse. For I will be merciful in, unrighteous, or in unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that was God's promise to us this morning. So if you're sitting out here this morning, and uh, you think that you've done something that can't be forgiven, you're wrong. You know, God gave his life and died on that cross, and his redemptive blood in his body is that forgiveness. So when you wake up every morning, your page is empty. And with that, let's go to prayer. Father God, we just come to you this morning, and we know you were the one that made us pure. Lord, we just thank you for that sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, that died on that cross and loved us so much, and he forgave those sins. For that, we are eternally grateful. And help each and every one of us as we sit here this morning and get ready to partake of communion to just quietly reflect on what that sacrifice truly means. And we pray that in your son's name. Amen. And this is from the book of Matthew. Why are they reading? Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to him, to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Let us do likewise. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us do likewise. (laughs) 
Now we'll go ahead and pray over our offerings. And the offering stations are in the back of the church. And there's also an opportunity for you to give online. Father God, you've given us so much, so much to be grateful for. And you ask so little of us in return. Lord, I just pray that we as a church make our offerings and tithes to you this morning in a way that's pleasing to you and help us to use those to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Morning. Um, you notice in here, I think you, Stephen might have mentioned it, a lot of youth activities going on. Uh, read through the bulletin, a lot of stuff going on. A uh, couple things that aren't in the bulletin, uh, didn't get them in time. Uh, Margaret Rupp uh, had surgery this past week, hip replacement, and um, doing a little bit better today, but she was having a rough time there the first couple of days after surgery. So we need to be in prayer for her and, of course, for her daughter, Linda. Uh, who's staying with her and taking care of her. Not sure uh, if she's going to stay there in the swing bed program or going to a nursing home or what, but we need to be in prayer for her. And also, Shirley Shoemaker, she uh, took a tumble and um, looked like somebody just kind of beat on her. She's in the hospital right now, and she may be looking at shoulder surgery, possible shoulder replacement surgery. So be in prayer for her during this time, too. And also just received this through Dennis from the Bartons. Uh, this is Michael writing. I'm going to read you the whole thing here. I'm writing a little sooner than normal, but we would appreciate your prayers. Yesterday, Anna started feeling ill, and later Megan started too. So today we made a quick decision, and I'm on my way to Dallas alone. We're both negative for COVID. Please pray for their quick recovery, for protection, and all of our health. Pray also against discouragement for all of us. We were looking forward to making this trip together and for Megan to reconnect with so many friends. And then he goes on to say, though, in the midst of disappointment and illness, we're still reminded of God's faithful help. Today, Jaira and Anna turned one year old. A year ago, we didn't know whether they would make it, but now they're thriving. Praise God. So we always should be remembering the Bartons and all that they've um, gone through in the tremendous mission that they work with. And also, we have a thank you note uh, from the Sears. It says, P Dear PVCC family, Thank you for the prayers, cards, text messages, and emails during our time of loss. The flowers were beautiful. This has been a difficult time for our family and the loss of Chris's mother and Jennifer's grandmother, but we rejoice in the hope we have in Jesus and everlasting life. Okay. We're back looking at Israel again today as we're going through our series on the family. Where we catch up with them today, they'd been in slavery for years and years and years. Praying, asking God for deliverance, God sent Moses to Pharaoh with the command, let my people go. But we know that Pharaoh didn't listen to that. We know the story of God bringing those ten plagues upon Egypt and Pharaoh, trying to convince them that it was in their best interest uh, to honor this request. Now the passage we're going to look at today is in Exodus chapter 12. It describes the beginning of the first and most important festival in the history of the Jewish people called the Passover. From the time of the beginning of the Passover up until today, every year Jewish God-fearing families have partaken of the Passover meal as closely as the New Testament commanded. Uh, their Passover meal celebrates the love of God who freed their ancestors from slavery, who passed over their homes because they obeyed him in putting the blood of a sacrificed lamb upon the door frames of their homes. But this Passover is really only the first feast in a week-long feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, page 53 in your Bibles, in the front of it, uh, again, I, it's a lengthy scripture, and rather than having it up here on the screen, you pull a Bible out, turn to page 53, and the ones there in the pews, and you can follow along with me as we read chapter 12. Um, it is a lengthy chapter. I'll try not to stumble over too many of the words. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are determined the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be your old males without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, then when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. 
Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat their meat roasted over fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread without, made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly, and another one on the seventh day. Do not work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the festival with unleavened bread, because it was on this day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in any of your homes. And anyone, whether foreigner or native-born, who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast, whether you live, wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders from Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a branch of hyssop, dip it into the blood of the basin, put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of your door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over the doorway. He will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that your Lord will give you as a promise, observe this ceremony. And when children ask you, what does this ceremony mean? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. Now, lengthy passage, but so much meaning in it for us today as we think about our households and how we do our best to raise them in a God-centered situation. Weekend or so ago, if you drove anywhere in or around Angola, you know that it was garage sale weekend in Angola. How many of you ladies like garage sales? Boy, some hands went up really quick. How many of you men like garage sales? Scott? No, no, no. How many of you have had a garage sale? Uh -huh. You know, it's kind of like moving in a small way. There are certain things that you find in your house when you're getting ready for a garage sale that just don't belong there anymore. Now, you might think those clothes will fit again someday, or those clothes for those of us that are older that had from the 60s might come back in style someday, uh, but they're not going to, and they probably won't. You find things. I'm not going to mention any names, but I know she's anticipating me saying it right now. You might find four complete sets of punch bowls and cups. Why would anybody have four complete sets of punch bowls and cups? And I understand from her husband at the garage sale, they couldn't even give them away. You know, we, we find stuff like that. Now, I don't know about you. Sometimes when I go to clean my garage or the shed in the spring, I, I, I think, what happened? Did this stuff breed during the winter? Because I know I didn't throw that much junk in there. I know last fall it was totally organized, but then comes spring, it's in disarray, and there's just literally stuff everywhere. Well, this passage is teaching us, kind of in like manner, there are certain things that don't belong in our bodies. There are certain things that don't belong in our minds. There are certain things that don't belong in our homes. Well, let's ask ourselves, what was the Feast of the Unleavened Bread designed to teach? Now, as we read... 
The Passover symbolized the freedom that God desired to give to his people. But then that feast was followed by six more days that focused on the fact that God's kind of freedom required that his people remove things from their lives and from their homes, specifically this idea of leaven. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God's people were instructed, as we read, not only not to eat leavened bread during that week, but they weren't al allowed to have anything that had any yeast in it in their homes. If they did, kind of a tough punishment here, they were to be cut off from their people. You see, yeast was used by God to the Israelite nation to symbolize the power of sin. When Israel offered bread to God along with those burnt offerings, you remember that bread was to have no yeast in it whatsoever. Jesus, talking to his disciples in Luke 12, 1, gave this warning. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak to his disciples first, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. As we go into the New Testament, and we look at the letters to the early churches. We read about the church at Corinth that had a man in their congregation who was engaged in sexual immorality. And pretty much everybody knew it, and they were just kind of accepting it, if you will. Paul wrote that they should not associate with this man until he repented. They weren't even to have any, weren't even to share a meal with him. He said if they insisted on looking the other way, that man's sin would taint the rest of them. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? So we see that God used yeast way back then and in the New Testament to kind of symbolize or portray sin in an individual's lives. Well, why would God use yeast to symbolize sin? Well, we recognize that yeast is what makes bread rise up and puff up. You know, crackers don't have any yeast in them. If you keep them sealed, they can last pretty much forever. But bread, if you leave it lay there before long, it's going to start rotting, if you will, from the inside and, and start having mold on it. Now, I'm not sure I was going to research this, but this sermon's long enough. I'm pretty sure that seven-grain and nine-grain bread, I don't think it's got yeast in, in it either. It just tastes nasty. Now, some of you probably like that, and you say it's good for you and stuff like I just like plain old White bread, as simple as that, you know, I got to eat it up before it turns bad or anything like that. But, but God here was saying that sin acts in our lives in many ways the same way that yeast works in a loaf of bread. It, it makes it taste good. Well, um, likewise, I guess you can say sin tastes good. If it didn't taste good, nobody would be tempted to do it. it. It doesn't take much yeast to change the shape of flour. It warps, if you will, the shape of the dough. Similarly... When sin enters into an area of one's life, it doesn't take much to change who you are. It doesn't make, take much to warp your, your character. The third thing is that yeast makes the bread look like it contains more flour than it actually does. That loaf of bread may not have a whole lot more flour in it than that cracker does, but because of what it does to it, it puffs it up. It, it makes it look light, larger. And in like manner, sin can make us believe that we have more in our lives than we really do. Sin like bitterness, sin like hatred, sometimes makes someone feel that they have more power or they're better than someone else. Sins like hypocrisy and bigotry make some people feel more important than they actually are. Now, sinning by viewing crude movies or sexually explicit materials can make some people believe that they're more mature, more growing up if they are, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. The sin of getting drunk or getting high makes people think They've gained more control. You see, sin can make people believe that we've gained more of something in our life, but in reality, all that person has gained is the opportunity for decay and rot. Because finally, yeast, yeast causes bread to mold and decay from the inside out. Like I said, if you leave a loaf of bread out too long, what happens? You know, it develops that mold, it starts to rot, it's no good anymore. Like I said, crackers, they can almost last forever if you keep them sealed up. But in the same way, sin has the power to cause our lives and our homes to decay and to rot. I believe firmly. That's why the Bible says God hates sin. Because he knows what sin can do to people. How it causes our souls to 
begin to decay, our homes to rot from the inside out. Now, like I said, the last few weeks we've been talking about how to raise a God-rated home in this R-rated society. Well, how can we keep the world's influences out of our homes? I think we keep it the same way we do as we try to keep intruders out. We make sure the windows are locked, the doors are locked, etc. I don't know about you, um, I, I, I start second-guessing myself. You know, every night we let the rat dog out, and, um, excuse me, that beautiful little dog that Cindy has, Snickerdoodle, <laughs> but, and I'm usually the one that lets him out, and after a while he barks and I let him back in, and we get in bed and we're laying there, and Cindy invariably says, did you lock the door? I said, well, of course I did, and I'm laying there thinking, did I lock that door? You know, am, am I, did I really lock that door? And I get up, and I go check, and pretty much I've always locked that door. Well, we as parents and grandparents, we're the gatekeepers, if you will. We're the ones that lock the doors of the house. We're the ones with the keys of the house, and God relies upon us to make sure the destructiveness of the world doesn't come in through the door, window, wherever it may be. Now, I'm not going to go through a long laundry list <coughs> excuse me, of things that we need to keep out of our homes, and I'm just going to highlight a few very quickly. We all know, we should know, that there are certain TV shows, movies, books, magazines, games, so on, that really teach lessons to our kids and our grandkids that we really don't want them to see, so we should not allow them in. We all know that our kids shouldn't be associating with certain kind of other individuals. We need to be careful about that. I remember my mom with a guy that we had in Whitewater, and he, he was kind of rough, always carried a knife and stuff like that. Well, Mom let us associate with him, but whenever he came to our house, she'd say, Denny, take that knife out of your pocket, and put it up here, and she kept a close watch on what we were doing that time. We all know that if our kids get a hold of alcohol or drugs, it can destroy them. <coughs> so why should we have those in our home? I did a little quick research. 30% of all parents drink in front of their little kids. 20% of kids at one time or another are embarrassed by their parents drinking. Eight-year-olds, 37% of those have tasted alcohol. By the time they reach 12, 66% have. And guess where they got it? In the house. There are those increased opportunities when we have it there in the house. Let me ask you a quick question. Which is more dangerous to have in your house, a can of beer or a rattlesnake? About two people a year die from a rattlesnake bite a year. 5,000 teens die every year from alcohol-related accidents and stuff. So you tell me which is more dangerous to have in your home and expose your kids to. Now, you know, we like to lambast our presidents and all that, but I'll tell you what, I don't care what you say about Jimmy Carter. Do you know he's the only president that banned alcohol in the White House? I think that's major kudos to him for having the fortitude to stand up for his Christian faith in a situation where everybody else said, this is what you do when dignitaries and stuff come in, and he banned it totally. We all know that the damage gambling could do in people's lives. Well, why do I want that in my family? You see, I believe so strongly that God, as he told the Israelites, is telling us today that we have to make our minds up that anything that would hurt our family should not be let in, whether it's through the front door, the back door, an open window, wherever it is. Now, there's a thought process. We have all these ratings for TV shows and stuff like that. And you get to the MA, you know what that is. That's for mature audiences only. In other words, they're saying, you know what? You're a grown-up. You can handle this. These are mature programs. You make sure your kids leave the room. We'll put them on late at night. And what they're trying to tell us is that what we watch is not going to influence our kids or our grandkids. I think that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. One person said this, pay close attention. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. You see, by giving the impression to kids 
that certain kinds of TV programs, certain kind of activities, certain kind of beverages, whatever, that's grown-up stuff. We're telling our kids a lie. As simple as that. You know why? Because what do all kids want to do faster than anything else? Grow up. They want to be older than they are until they reach a certain age, and then they want to be younger than they are, you know. But anyway, the kids want to grow up fast. They can't wait till they grow up. And they will pursue maturity as early as possible. And when we say this is a sign of a grown-up, this is only for mature individuals, you tell me that they don't want to do that as quick as they can because they want to be grown up. You see, the moment we buy into the heresy of this dichotomy, that our morality is somehow different than the morality that we expect from our kids, the lock on the door is broken and the world's coming in. That's why God didn't teach his people to remove the leaven only from their children's lives, but from everybody's lives. Not even a speck of it in the cupboard. He taught them to get these things completely out of the house, out of every room, out of the lives of everyone. Essentially, that means simply this. If it's bad for your kids... It's bad for you. I don't see any other way around what God is teaching right here. Paul said that we read, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And all it takes is a simple opening of the door for sin to enter into your home, and it affects the lives of everybody you love. You know as well as I do, if, if here's the line in the sand, and, and you know you shouldn't step over it, but for some reason you step over it, but then you come back, how easy is it? to step over the second time, and then maybe, see what I'm saying? Once we cross that line, it gets easier and easier to cross it time and time and time again. Well, here's something else I believe God's teaching us here. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread was only done once a year. They removed the leaven from their homes roughly in the month of April. Now, that's kind of something we do in the month of April, spring cleaning if you will. I remember when I was getting ready to move out of the house at Fish Lake, I had this big old house, and I had all this stuff. Oh, my gosh. So I got a big dumpster. I had a giant garage sale, but then I had this dumpster, and I kept throwing stuff in it, and I had a four-by-four four sheet of plywood, and every time Logan and Tan had come over, they were younger then, I'd say, dumpster dump, boys, and I'd throw that piece of plywood up there, and they'd, go up, they'd get up there. They thought it was fun. They'd jump up and down on it. Now, why were they doing that? I had more junk to get rid of, and then I finally put a sign out, free, and I put it by this maple tree, and I'd find stuff, and I'd put it out there. There were some people coming by every day to see what I was laying out there so they could grab it and take it home with it. I even had one guy one time come up. He says, can I go through your dumpster? I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. And he wasn't looking for metal to, to sell. He was looking for stuff to hoard, I think. And he's dragging this trash out and, and taking it home with it. You know, once in a while, you know, we, we need to do that in our homes. We need to do that. In our lives also. You know, I didn't plan on, I don't think anybody plans on having all that clutter in the garage and everything when you scratch your head and say, why in the world am I keeping this? Why do I have four sets of punch bowls and cups? We, you know, we don't plan on that. It, ju it just kind of happens. And in the same way with the worldly influences, because in spite of our best efforts, some of the world's trash, the R-rated thinking and morality can slip into our homes. And when that happens, we need to make sure we, as quickly as possible, get rid of it. Now, in the Jewish society that we just read about to prepare for the Passover, they spent an entire week scourging the house for each and every small crumb of yeast they could find because God promised for seven days no yeast is to be found in your homes. That's what he told them. In other words, they weren't just getting rid of the yeast that happened to be laying around on the floor. They looked in every nook and cranny, every hidden corner to get rid of it. And that's what we need to do in our homes, folks. As parents and grandparents, that magazine prescription, that book, that TV program, are those undermining my faith, therefore undermining the faith of my kids? You see, problems in our homes, allowing some of these small things can become thinking, well, just a little bit of trash isn't going to hurt. Have you all ever watched that show, Home uh, Hoarders? Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, obviously, <laughs> Greg watches it there. You think, how'd that happen? How did that happen? Well, I guarantee you, they didn't decide, oh, I'm just going to fill my house with trash. A little bit at a time, and then it became overwhelming. God realizes that's what sin can do to us if we're not careful. 
a little bit, a little bit, and all of a sudden, our noses are underwater. Well, I want you to remember from this sermon that there are certain false concepts that undermine your efforts to protect your family for the influence of the R-rated world. Three false concepts that undermine our efforts to protect our family. Two of them we've already covered. First concept, as an adult, you can have a different morality than your children. False concept. Second one, a little bit of sin won't make any difference. False concept. But there's a third false concept. Now listen carefully. Simply removing sinful influence of your home will protect your family. You might, wait, you might say, wait a minute, preacher, that's what you've been talking about the whole sermon. No, that's a false concept also. This springs from the concept that freedom comes from removing sin from our lives. Actually, Scripture teaches that freedom comes from God. And because we have freedom from God, then we remove sin from our lives because He's shown us mercy and we want to obey Him. This Feast of Unleavened Bread focused on the symbol of sinfulness from the home, but that week-long festival was a celebration of their freedom from slavery. The Passover meal, it wasn't the removal of sin that it made them free. God had made them free, and that reminded them of that. Removing the leaven, removing sin from our homes is not what's going to make us free. Removing that sinful element was based upon the freedom God had given them and the freedom God gives us. They removed the sin because... God had freed them, and they wanted to do their best to live in obedience to him. Now, that isn't simply just an Old Testament idea. Romans chapter 6, in the previous chapter of Romans, Paul explained that God loved us so much, he forgave our sins. So then he starts there in verse 1 uh, with this idea that, well, if God loves the fact that he can remove our sins, if we sin more, he'll love us more. Well, listen to what Paul says for seven verses. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who's died has been set free from sin. So this is telling us that our freedom comes from Jesus Christ. And because we have freedom through Jesus Christ, we should have no desire, no desire to engage in anything that would be detrimental to our faith and to our family. You know, too many times... People say they don't want to become a Christian until they do the spring cleaning themselves, until they clean up their lives. They fail to realize that that's not what it's all about. Not removing sins from the past is going to make them acceptable to God. We can only be free when we accept Christ on his terms. I had a cousin, and I'm so thankful uh, that he's a believer now. But for years and years and years, this is what he always told me. He said, I've got to clean my life up. I've got to clean my life up. I kept saying, no. You don't have to clean your life up. God will take you right where you are and cleanse you totally. Well, finally, through someone besides me, I'm sure, but I'm thankful that it happened, that he recognized that. You see, the scripture tells us his terms are to simply have faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to repent of our sins, to confess Christ as our Lord and Savior, to be baptized into him, and then do our best to live a life through Jesus. That is when our spring cleaning Our cleansing of our closets, if you will, will be effective and beneficial. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for for your love. We thank you, Father, that you do take us right where we are. Accept us, cleanse us, give us new life. But help us to realize, Father, just as God told the Israelites, just as Paul told the church at Rome, we're reminded today that we should have a desire to do all that we can, not that we're going to accomplish it, but just do the best that we can to get these influences out of our lives, out of our homes, that begin to cause us to fall away from God, to cause that schism between us and between you. So, Father, give us courage, give us boldness to live that life that exemplifies your Son, but let others know that we have freedom through Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Let's be standing, shall we? Bow our hearts, we bend our 
I don't want anybody walking out of here with this big guilt complex thinking, man, I messed up. We all did. There's been more than one time over the years that I had to go to my kids and say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have acted like that. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I hope you understand that I messed up, and I'm sorry that I did that. I really like what Jeff said in the community meditation. It kind of set up what we're talking about today. We all have today to start over, if you will. We've all made mistakes, every one of us here. As I've made mistakes, and I know all of you have too. But you know what? We've got this day of life that God has given us, and whatever days he has for us, to do what's right, to do our best to set that example of our love for Christ and the freedom that we have because he has set us free. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>